So I might just step in, Terry, if that's okay, uh, for now to say that what we are announcing, which is very exciting, but is that Australia, um, so Circular Australia has appointed our first Chief Circular Engineer. We're really proud to say that that's Professor Ali Abbas. Um, Ali is Australia's leading chemical mm -hmm. and biomolecular engineer. Um, and he will take on this new role of um, Chief Circular Engineer with Circular Australia. And, you know, it's really important the role that engineering is going to play in our transition. We're seeing this conference today, understanding the connection between net zero, reducing carbon emissions, but also uh, dealing with those other crises of uh, limited finite, finite resources, but the depletion in biodiversity, and how do we bring together circular economy with these big problems? If we solve one and we start to reduce carbon with new technologies, we have to make sure that those technologies are creating perverse outcomes for our biodiversity or increasing waste streams. So the engineering is so important for this. Ali is um, head of school chemical and biomolecular engineering, and he's also director of the Waste Transformation Research Hub at the University of Sydney. And he'll be working with Circular Australia on some really exciting projects and understanding you know, where those parts, where those uh, sweet spots are to improve our understanding of uh, engineering solutions for circular economy. With science and innovation leading, we know that Australia can deliver new industries and hundreds of thousands of new jobs positioning itself as a global leader. And yesterday we heard from our uh, research and innovation industry minister, uh, the Honourable Ed Fusick, about the importance of bringing together engineering and innovation solutions to take on these, these challenges, but it must be carbon reduction and circular economy to do that. So I'm delighted that you're going to be joining us, Ali. Um, it's going to be an exciting time and I might invite you up now to say a few words, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Terry, if you can hear us. We're so sad that you can't be with us today in person and uh, share this moment. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and good morning to you all and uh, good to see you and thank you one and all uh, in person and online for coming today. Uh, well, the global transition to renewable energy has received significant attention in the last week uh, at COP27 with global leaders debating how to rapidly drive um, down emissions. There isn't a shadow of doubt that we must urgently transition to renewable energy to secure our future, but it's only half the story. That's the message we've been telling people. We need to radically shift in how we design, manufacture and use materials. The plastics, metals, fibers, chemicals, food, uh, and building materials that are produced, bought and sold every day to power a global population that just hit eight billion. And we need to embrace circular engineering, a new concept for some, but as Australia's first um, chief circular engineer for Circular Australia, this is engineering or this is this engineering discipline will drive the jobs and industries of our future here in Australia and around the world. Our one way take make waste economy has led to widespread resource depletion of the Earth's finite resources. And of course, this is really starting to breach the planetary boundaries. Lots of issues, lots of grand challenges we need to all work together to solve. When most of these uh, products we're talking about reach their end of life, some are recycled. There's been some really good recycling stories. However, by far, the majority end up in landfills and stockpiles, further releasing greenhouse gases, leaching toxic chemicals and polluting our environment. And the manufacture and use of products and food creates a massive 45% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The good news is that nothing truly ever disappears thanks to the first law of thermodynamics. It asserts that energy and matter are conserved. Uh, energy or matter cannot be created from nothing or destroyed into um, matter, um, only transformed. Conserving matter, therefore, is quite a important principle in this conversation. On one hand, this means that the waste we create piles up and that much of the energy we burn ends up in the greenhouse gases. But it's also a force that we can use for good. 
By recognizing and understanding this first law and by tapping into the great leaps in chemical engineering and material science, we can create circular economies where goods and materials are reversed. In the past, we had far fewer techniques to do this, but now we have reached a chemical processing point where even plastics uh, or plastic uh, waste, mixed plastics can be transformed back into fuel or chemically recycled back into naphtha, the feedstock for plastics remanufacturing. And greenhouse gases can be captured and that carbon in the greenhouse gases becomes the resource for further useful materials. Um, many are now interested in the circular economy, which is very pleasing because they see it as a solution. Designing out waste and pollution and circulating products to tackle the complex crises facing the um, above uh, mentioned challenges uh, goes above and beyond decarbonization, including biodiversity loss, that's quite an important area, and resource scarcity. It cannot rely on scientific progress alone. As the name would suggest, our economic structures and thinking need to change too. Importantly, a circular economy is not only about recycling either. Key message, it's a, a much larger whole of society system in the circular economy, business models operate through the leasing of services rather than sales of products and are driven by economic incentives shared by all involved in the product's life cycle. Extending product life becomes a deliberate business target in the circular economy instead of single use. Let's take sol solar panels as a good example. Australia is now a world leader with more than uh, 3 million solar systems installed on rooftops about 30% of homes and increasing rapidly. By, rough, by my rough, you know, back of the envelope estimate, that is about 54 million panels, which if stacked up would equate about to about 214 Mount Everest. And if they're put end to end, that's about two and a half lengths of the Earth's equator. What happens to these panels when they are inevitably reach their, reaching their end of life or are no longer fit for purpose? massive stockpiles. A circular business model would look at that service provided by the panels rather than the panels as an individual product. The model defines a business, a circular business that would own the panel throughout its life, offering the consumer a lease, maintenance and repair arrangement instead of a sale contract. For that business, the product sale profits shift to leasing income. This provides incentive for that business to seek to increase efficiency of the solar panel product and importantly design it so it has a prolonged life. By re-engineering re that panel, that circular engineering, through better design. Those vast quantities of end-of-life panels, and that's the same example to other renewable technologies, batteries included, should not be landfilled but instead refurbished, recycled, or broken down to extract the extensive value within these products, the silicon, the silver, the glass, the aluminum, and many other materials. By designing out waste and pollution, circulating products and materials at the highest value and regenerating nature, we will not only reduce waste, but emissions and get closer to meeting the Paris targets. So with this, I wrap up, I think we need to continue to work on this issue of materials, not the poor cousin of energy, but a close nexus between energy and materials. So our co collective responsibility is to make a change in the way we make and consume things. Incremental change will not be enough. Again, I thank you all for coming today and thank you, Lisa, for this excellent announcement. And with this, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you, Lisa, CEO of Circular Australia, who will be also the chair of this session continu continuing forward. And Lisa is Circular Economy and uh, Circular Carbon Business Transformation Leader, and uh, as I said, CEO of Circular Australia, a national independent non-for-profit organization leading the transition to a uh, circular carbon and circular economy in Australia. Lisa has been successfully advising industry and government in developing new policy frameworks and regulations that bring about market change to enable the circular zero carbon economy over the past 20 years. 
Um, this work has covered the supply chains, infrastructure, energy, water, waste, and mobility sectors, both in Australia and the UK. So it's with great pleasure to hand you back uh, over to Lisa to chair the session. Thank you again. Well, thank you so much, Ali, and very exciting times ahead. So I guess we want to um, today talk about you go, accelerating the Australian circular economy and what do we need to do to actually make that happen faster? We don't just have one crisis. We actually have a number of crises. We've got, we'll have 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And we simply don't have enough resources to continue to consume the way we are. So yes, we've got this carbon problem and there's a lot of action at the moment, which is very exciting. We've got a new government focusing on that. We've got COP and companies really understanding, okay, I think I know what my carbon footprint is. And a lot of that, as Ali said, is sitting around energy. But there's also a huge amount uh, of carbon embedded, about 45% in products. So that's a problem. We've got to get rid of uh, and reduce that carbon. But on top of that, we're take, make and wasting stuff. So we're just you know, throwing it away once we use it once. Sometimes we don't even use it once. You know, medical sector, we've got a lot of their products and gowns and things that have use by dates on them and just get trashed straight away. They haven't even been used. So the taking and making and wasting approach, it's actually not, not going to work. I use this example a lot because it's really visual, but, you know, if you're in the business of extracting gold and silver, if that's your business, then this statistic is a, is a good one to think about. We have more, there's more gold and silver in a ton of iPhones than there is in a ton of ore from a gold or silver mine. So imagine that. In the future, if that's your business, where are you going to get the gold and silver from? And these are finite resources. And there's a lot of impact from mining, obviously. Um, we need it. We need these minerals and we need them. We're going to continue to grow. Our economy is going to continue to grow. But we need to be thinking about ways we can get these resources and the ways we can use products and consume things and get what we need in a way that doesn't put that pressure on biodiversity, actually regenerates. And it is actually possible to do that. This is so exciting about circular economy. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges um, and we need, I might need a technical person to come and put that back up. Sorry, Aaron, can you help me? Um, we need um, innovation, we need research, uh, but we also really need to be working together. So the crises, of course, um, yeah, this one here, thank you. It's, uh, the crisis of carbon, but we've also got this phenomenal biodiversity loss. And then, of course, we've got the depletion of natural resources. Um, and, you know, making critical change to keep those resources in the economy at their highest value um, is where that large tapped opportunity is going to be in the future. And it's why we're starting to see um, circular economy emerging as this really critical framework that can actually tackle those multiple crises not just the energy transformation. And in that <clears throat> resource and carbon constrained future, there simply won't be any economic um, progress without us making these big changes to keep those resources going round and round. And we can do that through design, we can do it through recycling, but we, we can't be burning and we can't be landfilling um, these resources. We need them to stay in the economy. And that's how we're also going to grow jobs and industries of the future. And as I mentioned before, we heard from our new um, science and um, innovation industry minister, Ed Husick, yesterday about the importance of circular economy and carbon reduction in driving our new economy for Australians. These are going to be the jobs of the future. And Australia's got a really good opportunity to... Oh, here we go. Sorry, I've got that next slide up. Australia's got a really good opportunity to position ourselves as a, as a global leader on this. Circular economy has also really been embraced in the last few years. I don't know about each of you and your stories and your businesses and organisations, but you know, COVID was the first catalyst that got us to understand, well, all our supply chains have been impacted, obviously following the China sword uh, policy. China said no, and we have to manage our own rate waste, which is been a big catalyst. Then we had COVID, which affected most supply chains. Um, on top of that, we've had changing trading partners and geopolitics, which is really um, means business as usual is not going to be viable. And we need to think about other ways. 
So circular economy solutions are going to help deliver this new federal agenda, the Albanese government agenda, the future made in Australia policy, national reconstruction, how we build manufacturing capability onshore, and how we actually buy Australian products for that resilience um, to decarbonise our economy, but also to think about how we can rebuild uh, biodiversity. For those circular nerds, you'd be aware of um, the federal government's, uh, Australian environment ministers rather, led by the federal um, environment minister, federal government's ambition around circular economy in a communique they put out last month. So we now have an ambition for circular economy by 2030. And this ambition is really important. Again, it's sending the right signal to industry and all of us that making changes to design out waste will be rewarded and is important. And actually, this is quite a strong goal. So we've got a lot of work to do to work out how we get there. Circular Australia has, uh, there's lots of definitions of circular economy. Circular Australia is really focused on harmonizing definition metrics, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. This is our definition that circular economy decouples economic growth from the consumption of finite resources by designing out waste from the system. And it's based on those three principles. We design out waste and pollution at every stage of production, use and end of life. And I might add that Australia has got some catching up to do with the UN and Europe and other jurisdictions around the banning of toxic chemicals, which we actually don't need, but are causing a lot of detriment to the environment. And um, I'm seeing Nicole here from Planet Art, but one of them is PFAS, um, which Nicole and Planet Art have done work on. There's also other um, critical chemicals that we actually don't need in our environment. They stay there causing a lot of damage to biodiversity. So getting rid of them out of the economy is really important, designing out that pollution. The second one, of course, keeping materials in the economy, that's great, but we've got to do that at their highest value. We've got to be designing things uh, to stay in the economy for, for longer. And unfortunately, we couldn't hear from Kari Halevi from Citra from the Innovation Fund this morning. We had some complications with audio, but his message too is, around um, regulation that ensures products can actually stay in use for, for say 15 years. We've all got the washing machine story or the white goods story when it breaks, out it goes, no one can fix it, it's cheaper to buy a new one. Sorry, people can fix it, but the cost point is much higher than buying a new one. So out it goes onto the curb and into landfill. And as we start to think about design, how do we make sure that those washing machines and other white goods are designed to last, they get taken back by the manufacturers through product stewardship and um, can be repaired. That repair economy is really important. And the final point here, the final um, uh, uh, third point is regenerating natural systems. And how can we do that through, for example, water recycling, recycling of organics, removing those toxic waste and of course, tree planting. Circular Australia also supports a circular economy that matches environmental goals with social ambitions and inclusion. And that's another big thing that has come out of COVID and um, aligns with the sustainable development goals. Ali mentioned this point already. I'm gonna just present it to you because it's a really good slide from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but it also reminds us of those hidden and embedded um, embodied emissions. Because we're just not gonna to get to um, zero carbon if we can't tackle those um, emissions that are embedded. And that's where the circular economy comes in. So thinking about food, cement, steel, aluminium, plastics, how do we keep them going in the economy? How do we create green alternatives? And that's some exciting innovations, Ali, that we've been seeing at the conference um, this week here at University of Sydney on how we actually do that. Um, this is really important. So looking beyond just your scope one and two emissions, scope three and even four emissions. How do we reduce those? I wanted to talk about what Australia needs to do to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And the first thing that we think at Circular Australia we need to do is develop that roadmap. Um, it really starts with coordination through that a national roadmap. And, since 2016, many countries, including G20 countries, have been setting circular economy strategies. UK, Japan, Canada, China, Korea, South, um, South Korea, um, South Africa, Indonesia, France, Italy. And then there's been strong leadership, obviously, from 
uh, the, the Finland and the Netherlands and Finland have aimed to set a target of 100% circularity by 2025, um, which is very challenging. Um, and, you know, each economy is different. Australia has a resource intensive economy. So the levers and the mechanisms through which we are looking to cut carbon and transition to circularity are going to be very different from some of these countries. But we can, we've got a powerful opportunity to be a leader globally and we can also be a strong leader in our region by learning from a lot of the progressive agendas. So as a dedicated um, not-for-profit working um, through our network, Circular Australia is very keen to drive um, a roadmap. We see this as very important in terms of setting the ambition, reducing the risk and aligning our goals uh, around circular economy for that to achieve that 2030 ambition. Metrics is another really critical area. If we can't measure it, we're not going to be able to uh, achieve the outcomes. So we need to develop the right appropriate metrics that are right in the Australian context. And again, this is an ambition that Circular Australia and in our previous role as New South Wales Circular have been very um, focused on. Um, and you, you can see that, you know, from, the, from this quote last year from the G20, that harmonising metrics through internationally with global best practice is also really important. So while we've got our bespoke economy, we also need to be tying into that global economy. It's, it's going to be very important and Australia's got some catching up to do around metrics. So we have been working, as I said, over a couple of years on this and a couple of weeks ago, we, we launched our metrics dialogue to kick off our next project, which um, we're hoping will be a guide of national metrics for a circular economy. And this work was, oops, uh, the circular economy metrics review was done by the UTS, which is one of our partners, ISF at UTS, to get that dialogue going about what governments and organisations can report, how they can report and measure progress towards designing out waste and pollution, cutting all those massive carbon, hidden carbon emissions we just talked about and waste streams, and how we can generate those and measure new circular economy jobs, where are they going to come from? So designing out waste and carbon from our economy is now the core aspiration of a lot of companies and governments and communities. But to turn that aspiration into action, we really do need to set targets and change behaviour. And so we looked at about 30 uh, potential, well, identified about 30 potential metrics, um, which we examined across material use, energy, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, investment, water jobs, and natural environment, including a case study of how that worked for New South Wales. And so some of the um, measurement points we looked at is carbon savings from recycling, new investment in recycling infrastructure and capabilities capacity. Um, and I can see Katie Dowling, the chair of our finance and investment task force here, which the finance sector is really interested in this. Sustainable procurement, industrial ecology performance in business networks, jobs in the use and reuse repair and recycling economies, the circularity gap um, on how far we need to go in economy-wide material flows. So this exploratory work, it builds on international frameworks for measuring circular economy by defining those metrics um, and also on, and we hope to integrate that with Australian um, uh, best practice as well because other jurisdictions and organisations have also been working in this space in Australia and it needs to be coordinated. So we're excited to start um, this dialogue to enable governments and organisations and businesses to set those targets and me measure their progress. I mentioned before the sustainable development goals, circular economy really does tackle a lot of these goals, um, both directly and indirectly. And, you know, for, circular economy to succeed in Australia, it needs to be embedded, not just in policy and businesses and boardrooms, but we also need to be working to improve and deliver on these global ambitions, particularly for our region um, and also uh, for Australians.
one of the other things that we need to do um, is to embrace the 10 R's of recycling and, and, and I think the R's of growing actually. So there's a couple more um, in here around uh, regulation um, and other things that we need to add. But this is a really important slide uh, that a lot of the Northern European countries have been um, relying on to form a circular economy and form, inform their roadmap and inform action. As a systems transition, circular economy really requires new approaches and cooperation between sectors. And it's not enough, as Ali mentioned earlier, for us to be focusing just on um, recycling and waste management. You can see here that recycling and recovery are, are sort of down the bottom. This is actually a hierarchy. So how we actually, you know, while that's really, they're really critical components of the circular economy, we need to do more work to design out waste and uh, pollution and keep those products at their highest value in the economy. And this can be achieved through new infrastructure, manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, but we also need to be building the markets for reuse and repair and designing things to be last and designing things to be repair and repaired and providing that support uh, for the community to do so. So an Australian circular economy roadmap must embrace policy and regulation market reform, uh, from environment and water to research and industry and innovation um, to ensure more sustainable consumption patterns and prudent use of natural resources within industries to unlock these R's that we can see here now. But I do think we could add in market reform and regulation to these R's as we get going. So we would encourage you all to think about this and apply these principles to your, uh, your businesses. Um, we mean, I, I mentioned before also in your organisations, I mentioned before that it also starts with designing out things that are toxic and we just don't understand often what's in our products and the work that Circular Australia has been doing with the different sectors. The waste streams have been dealt with by contracts, so often understanding the um, recycle component or opportunity of their waste streams is an unknown to an organisation. So we're going to see a lot of introspection around that and a lot of organisations seeking to understand what's in those, a little bit like um, what's in our, cal what are the calories in our foods? What's the embedded emissions? What are the things that need to be designed out in products and can be replaced with other things? And that's a massive, um, uh, you know, job opportunity and investigative piece that we need to do as we start to make the transition to the circular economy. Last year, Circular Australia looked at some key sectors that are catalyzing uh, the transition um, to unlock this $2 trillion, estimated $2 trillion opportunity. And what our research found uh, is that Australia's ban on waste exports really only scratches the surface of the Australian circular economy opportunity with many other materials heading to landfill, and you can see some here. We're still missing out on that, the economic benefits of keeping them in productive productive use longer while, ad while addressing the nation's waste problems. The Australian Bureau of Statistics experimental waste account statistics show that Australia generated over 75 million tonnes of waste, and that was 2018-19. They also show that four materials, glass, plastics, tyres and paper and cardboard, and that's on the exports ban list, represent about 30%, 32%, or 1.5 million tonnes of the total 4 million tonnes of waste exported that year, which we know has ignited momentum and new investment in recycling infrastructure, which is going to be coming online. But looking beyond our exported waste, there's an even more significant onshore opportunity for materials recovery and, and emissions reductions. It's five times the size of those waste, that waste export market. So the 20 million tonnes of materials that go to landfill every day. So there's some significant opportunities that we can unlock and some of those areas around organics, masonry and plastics. And Australia's waste generation has actually risen and will continue to rise, 10% in the two years to 2019 and it's continuing up. So building and demolition activity in particular is a key driver of this increase given the you know, national infrastructure boom that we've had and will continue to have. And this is expected to grow even further 
in coming years with additional state and federal governments, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, um, stimulus measures contributing to a record breaking 300 plus billion public infrastructure pipeline across the country. So the sheer volume of materials being disposed of onshore flags a significant opportunity for investment beyond those on the band list. And that's what we wanted to raise in this slide. The sectors that we looked at also, infrastructure, regional precincts, households, manufacturing, households, and David from Combank is gonna be talking about that in a second. So I won't um, stay too long on this slide, but obviously infrastructure, I just mentioned that opportunity with this huge boom and investment in um, public funds into that agenda. Um, regional precincts is a really exciting one and uh, the University of Sydney and Ali has been working on this in terms of how we um, can emulate um, circuit and embed circular economy principles and co-locate industries who can use that molecular circularity to create new product, products out of waste streams. And the case study we've given here is the special activations precincts, which will be Australia's first Unigo eco-industrial precinct, and we hope that they can be emulated. There's some consumer index that David's going to talk about in a minute. Now, it just comes down to changing behaviour, doesn't it? I mean, these are big changes that we're talking about. How do we get what we need in a way that um, doesn't mean throwing something away? So as a service models, and Ali mentioned that earlier, how do we use as a service models, fashion as a service, mobility as a service, we're even seeing facades as a service in the built environment. And there's lots of other examples here because you can see Australia is one of the biggest um, we landfill, 27% of our waste compared to about 2% in the Netherlands. And we're one of the biggest material users um, in the OEC region, second to Chile. So there's a lot of change we need to think about and needs to happen and we need to work together to do, particularly around supply chains. Circular Australia is... Uh, has, is about to release its strategic plan. We're focusing on three and a few other areas. These three are the core areas at the moment. And the way we're doing this is one, building um, the evidence and credibility around circular economics and metrics. So how do we value the externalities in the business case to recycle and reuse, but beyond that, to share and keep materials in the economy longer, to protect biodiversity, Huge amount of work needs to continue to be done to pr produce evidence on the economic benefits of this. And I think it's up to all of us to think about how we do that and share that data. And Circular Australia has made that our priority. The metrics piece we've talked about already, we need to measure it and there needs to be coordination to do that. And Circular Australia sees itself as having a role around that. Supply chains is another important area. Circular Australia has been working with the hospital sector um, to put its arms around um, industry and research to catalyze new supply chains. So taking needle caps and ampules from St. Vincent's right in the middle of COVID, this was considered an unsafe uh, waste stream that was turned into roller doors and uh, wind farm components uh, for the um, renewable energy sector rather than being incinerated and going to landfill. So how do we create these new supply chains and scale them is something that circular economy is interested in, uh, circular Australia is interested in and also the collaboration and research. We have a number of task forces, finance and investment, um, precincts and infrastructure. Um, we also have a national task force, an industry task force and a national one with all state governments and territory governments where we're working to harmonize policy and accelerate the transition to a circular economy. So sorry, this is playing up this little mouse. That's it from me. Um, thank you very much for your time to listen. We've got a really interesting agenda ahead of us, uh, but first we're going to hear first from some other experts, starting with David Martin from um, Combank. So, David, um, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce you. You're the National uh, Manager of Retail and E-Commerce at the Commonwealth Bank. Um, with your team, you've developed an insightful consumer report on circular economy. Uh, which is giving businesses a new mandate for action, establishing um, yourself as an expert in circular economy, consumer behaviour, which is exciting because we need more experts there. Um, 
And sitting within Commonwealth Bank's business banking division, your role is to provide Commonwealth Bank's retail and e-commerce customers with strategic thought leadership and actionable insights to help them succeed in their different markets while also supporting frontline bankers and product development teams. And you've worked at Amazon in the US and ANZ, um, and now you're at Common Bank. So over to you, David. Thanks, Lisa, for the introduction and, and thank everyone for your time and attention this morning. It, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to you about the research that we've been doing um, in the uh, circular economy space. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, my role is to sort of set that strategic direction for the retail industry across business banking and ComBank. And a big part of that is helping them educate themselves with uh, what consumers are thinking and how we can help solve future problems. So this, this piece of research we did is our latest in a series of consumer insights reports that we do. Uh, and the theme for this one was the circular economy. Um, and, and our research centered on a group of 5,600 consumers who were split evenly 50-50 male female, skew slightly more towards metropolitan areas and are spread across every age demographic. And those consumers are telling us that among the many challenges facing Australia, climate change and waste reduction are a really big concern. Uh, when we press them on the issue of climate change and waste, 85% are telling us that they're concerned about the level of consumption and waste in Australia and the flow on effects to society. When we drill down and look at age demographics, younger Australians are more concerned than, than other age groups who are more focused on things like uh, healthcare and caring for the elderly. 90% of young people are telling us that they're specifically concerned about waste and consumption levels. This issue of waste has been heightened by many of the recent environmental and economic challenges that the country is facing. The rising cost of living, supply chain challenges, issues affecting product availability and even the COVID pandemic are all adding to our anxieties about waste and, and consumption. But the interesting thing is when we ask consumers about their level of commitment personally to reducing waste, 58% of respondents feel as though they're doing more than their peers. And only 8% are willing to admit they're behind the curve. So if everyone's so committed, why is this still such a big concern? So like any big question, there are a lot of components to the answer to that question. It could be linked to the motivations of why people want to reduce waste. Here, we asked, what was your motivation to reduce your household consumption of waste? And you can see really big spreads across the motivating factors listed and across the age demographics. Younger Australians are calling out climate change and doing the right thing as their motivating factor, whereas older generations are more focused on the levels of waste and landfills and waterways. People with kids care about setting an example, but interestingly, their potential grandparents don't seem as concerned. Another potential answer is that the problem and the amount of stuff we have is just so big and we see it every time we turn the corner in our house. We asked our consumers to estimate how many items they had in their house that hadn't been used in the past 12 months. And you can see the various differences in the product categories. Unsurprisingly, we're most heavy in things like clothing and media items with books, CDs and DVDs with more than half of all respondents telling us they have six or more unused items in their house taking up valuable space. And at the other end of the spectrum, we're least saturated in auto products and parts with 71% not having anything lying around. But the most important thing is every category has some amount of unused product lying around. Based on these responses, we estimate that there's around 146 million unused clothing items sitting in the closets of Australians just taking up space and gathering dust. Another answer could be that even though we're regularly clearing out those items and taking stock of, of what we have, our true motivations don't appear to be 100% circular yet. 19% of people are telling us that they're cleaning out their unused items twice a year and a quarter of respondents are doing it at least once a year and 14% never do it, which blows my mind. But despite that commitment, Clearing space and reducing our amount of unused items, people are telling us that they're motivated by um, things like reducing clutter, the need to free up free space, 
and doing a spring plane versus more circular motivations like passing things on to those have a better need for it and reselling for cash, which are highlighted in orange. While all those previous points are really valid, it wasn't until we got to this next section where we thought we unlocked a, a really major theme as to why waste was still such a big topic. When we asked about the level of their knowledge and understanding of the circular economy, you can see that the overall level of in-depth knowledge in this area is relatively low. Only 24% of people claim they understand either a little or a lot about the principles and benefits of the circular economy with younger generations leading that charge. And the majority of our sample set admitted that they've never heard of the term with older generations or unaware of the group average. But when we educated the consumer on what circularity means, we uncovered a lot of interesting data. 66% of consumers thought that the circular economy can help combat waste issues. And 64% think that businesses need to, be more, need to do more to embrace circular principles. Consumers don't think that businesses are doing enough to further the circular economy in Australia. And you can see in green, the number of people who disagree with the statements on screen are very low. This was a really loud theme in our research. And for mine, it's a big reason why waste is such a concern. To put it bluntly, consumers think that businesses are not doing enough to minimise waste. Consumers have a clear desire to learn more about what businesses are doing, but 57% agree that they'd like to learn more about the businesses' circular initiatives that they're undertaking. And uh, just over a third of consumers are telling us they're willing to pay more to support a business that embraces and adopts circular principles. Now, I think this slide shows the dynamic nature of the circular economy because the nine is now 10 and it could be 12. But um, Lisa's explained this. Uh, and for those in the room, you know, a quick Google on, on what you see here um, will we'll really give you a good understanding of what those principles are. Um, but we think by adopting these behaviors across this hierarchy, starting with refusing waste and design and waste during the design and manufacturing process, businesses and, and people can change the way they consume and decrease their consumption impacts. Now this one's a bit of an eye chart, so please don't squeak too much, because the main takeaway here is that consumers see the circular economy as a waste reduction technique for every product category in both the retail and service industry. Very low numbers of consumers think that circular principles would be unlikely to make an impact in any given subcategory. And importantly, the sum of those who are in the possibly and definitely camp should be enough for every business to consider how they can adopt circular principles and incorporate them into their business. This groundswell of support for the circular economy and its principles came through when we asked how people currently dispose of unwanted items. As you can see, circular methods like donating and reselling feature prominently, but the overall list of responses is still very trash heavy. We also see big swings depending on the product category. Some like sporting equipment have higher resale appeal like the exercise bikes and home gyms we all bought during lockdown, where others like tools and hardware are destined for the donation bin or a council cleanup. And unfortunately, things like auto parts and household materials are heading towards the dump. Now this for me is where things got really interesting. The theme of increased participation from businesses came through really loudly. When we asked what options consumers want provided to help reduce waste, the overwhelming feedback was that there aren't enough easy options to help consumers reduce waste. 50% of people want more buyback and recycling programs. 49% want more convenient drop-off locations for unused items. 46 want to be incentivized financially to participate. And interestingly, 28% want more educational information about how to reduce waste. And if these services were available, consumers are overwhelmingly telling us that they absolutely would use them. We asked what services consumers think businesses should provide to help reduce waste, and every category had high demand. 88% want businesses to facilitate the donation of items for those in need. 82% want brands to provide repair services and 56% want brands to offer low use items on a rented basis. So your average consumer not only wants brands to produce good products and services, but they also want brands to facilitate product donations, buy back old items, recycle products, repair old products, and even offer the ability to buy 
versus, uh, so rent versus buy new. So really easy problem, right? And if we focus on that buy back option, we see in total 85% of consumers are telling us that they're already using or interested in using a business-led buyback program. Younger demographics are more keen on both participation and interest in these types of programs, but that's not to say that older Australians wouldn't use them as well. As you can see when we look at the yellow data set, the most interested age group in this type of service are baby boomers, who probably have the potential to benefit the most as they've generally accumulated this most stuff along life's journey. Given that trend, it's only natural to assume that the next generation of young Australians are going to be even more invested and involved here. And eventually these types of programs will become table stakes for Australian businesses. So now you might be thinking, we've already got several marketplace options. Why isn't that solving the issue? And again, there's a lot of answers to that question. Uh, as we can see, the number of people across all age demographics are using these marketplaces. And people are already making a decent amount of money through these platforms. But with much lower numbers of people using these outlets as a provider of products, we feel this means there must be a really large supply gap and the potential revenue from these platforms is probably understated. And when we look at people who have never used these services, we see a really large portion of older generations having never been involved, which likely is impacting our product selection and the overall effectiveness of waste reduction on these other platforms. So why is there a hesitation to participate? When we probe on what the barriers to selling and buying on these marketplace platforms are, we see a lot of hesitation linked to things like time wasters, scams, high levels of relative effort, and a general distrust in these platforms from both sides of the selling equation. Simply put, consumers don't want to be the one charged with this responsibility, which for mine brings us back to those business-led initiatives. The consumer knows and trusts the brand. Provided the brand or the business can develop a solution that's easy to participate in, it can remove many of the headaches you see listed on screen. And consumers are also telling us that you can charge a price premium for these types of initiatives. Specifically looking at the services sector, 60% of consumers are telling us they're willing to pay at least 10% more for a service that aligns with their sustainability values. As you can see, this is the highest in the hospitality space and lowest in personal care services like hairdressers and beauty therapists, but all in all, the variance is pretty small. And overall, people either don't think or don't know if there are enough sustainable choices within their budget range, highlighting again, the need to increase education around circularity initiatives in this space. Now, by no means do we think businesses need to embrace every circular or sustainable practice, as some aren't yet going to move the needle. As you can see here for hospitality, there are a large number of items on the consumer's radar. Everything from composting food waste to collecting rainwater make a list of items consumers want provided. And again, for accommodation, there are a large number of things that may down the line be something that businesses need to consider. For example, digital apps monitoring water consumption might not be the best investment right now with only 13% of people wanting it provided, but using renewable energy has a much higher demand rate at 30% at and might justify the investment. So all that data is really good, but what can a business do with it? Well, we think there's four key actions that can be undertaken as a quick first step. Firstly, make it more accessible and convenient to participate in what they're already doing. Breaking down those you know, engagement barriers seems to be a really big thing for the customer. Secondly, increase the level of consumer education about the initiatives that you're already undertaking. Increase the transparency on the why behind the circular and sustainable initiatives that you're undertaking, which therefore increases your credibility in this area. And finally, Understand your supply chain and ask some hard questions of your suppliers and their overall impact in this area so that you can inform your customer about the full uh, sustainable impact of your items. So to sum up, I hope that over the last 15 odd minutes, you can see that the Australian consumer wants a more circular economy. They want businesses to do more. Yeah, yeah they want businesses to do more. And they want to learn more about what businesses are doing. And if you have a product that could be bought back 
and recycled, consumers are telling us they absolutely would use this service. So with that knowledge, the question we're asking businesses is what are they gonna do about it? And it probably goes the same for everyone in this room. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, if you'd like a full copy of the report, uh, jump online and just Google uh, ComBank Consumer Insights and everything's there. So you didn't have to take photos and I apologize for not telling you earlier. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. And there's a lot in that report. So I'm super proud to be a partner with ComBank and David, um, it's great to be able to present this in this forum because it's food for thought and also permission for those, an opportunity for those thinking about moving into the circular economy. Well, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Nicole, who's head of, um, Nicole Garafana, who's head of, circular, head of circular economy development at Planet Arc, um, and uh, which is another foundational Australian circular economy. She's a foundational Australian circular economy leader. Nicole joined Planet Arc in May 2021, following 16 years' experience in the community waste environment, uh, environmental education and tourism sectors. She was the director of a non-governmental organisation in Barbados for eight years, and that experience led her to decide on a PhD and then the seven years of researching small island states globally, including four specifically focused on the plastic food and beverage packaging value chain, which form part of your PhD. You've now graduated, so congratulations, Dr. Dr. Nicole. Uh, well done. And you're also, um, Nicole's also an associate with the Australian Institute of Packaging, representing the AIP on the ANZAC, ANZPAC um, Plastics Pack Collection, Collective Action Group, um, which is part of the expedition, and you're also part of the Expedition Ambassadors Program and Island Innovation Ambassador Program and as a group member of the recently launched Engineering X Research Group. So welcome, Nicole, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Wow, it's nice to be in the lecture theatre. Um, hope everyone uh, is enjoying the morning. And to those online, I'm not sure how many we have online, but. Um, it's, it's really great to be here. And thanks for the invitation, Lisa and Ali, to be part of, of the event today. Um, let's see if I can start. Um, so I'm just going to stop on this slide for a second. Uh, so I'm here as the head of circular economy development, as Lisa introduced. Um, Shortened to the ACE Hub is one of many programs that Planet Arc has initiated. So Planet Arc, you may be familiar, has been going for 30 years. We're actually celebrating 30 years uh, this week, actually, on Thursday night. Uh, and over that time, Planet Arc has grown to be Australia's most trusted environmental behaviour change organisation. Um, some of the campaigns that you may be familiar with are Recycling Near You, National Tree Day, Cartridges for Planet Arc, uh, and most recently we celebrated National Recycling Week just a couple of weeks ago. So maybe you might have seen some uh, or even participated in some of the activities uh, that were held with National Recycling Week. But the Australian Circular Economy Hub was launched in November 2020. Um, and we have been able to receive support from the federal government to initiate the Australian Circular Economy Hub. Um, and we, again, are, are celebrating the two year uh, anniversary of that. Actually, it's just um, yesterday since it was launched two years ago. Um, so I'm here today, I've been asked to talk about consumers building on the research that David just presented very um, effectively and the report that they've published. And this is uh, some research that I've actually been quite interested in because the consumer element of circular economy, even in the work that we're doing with the ACE Hub, doesn't get as much airtime, if you will. Uh, it's a strong, we have a strong focus on industry and government, and rightly so, because of the numbers of the numbers purely. We're talking about volumes of materials that are flowing through. Um, and also the dollar value that those two, uh, if you call them sectors, uh, have control over. So government procurement is worth about $385 billion in Australia every year. It's about 16% of GDP. So even if we can make small, maybe even 10% of that total spend, of course, that includes everything from defence services, et cetera. But even 10% of that could make a really significant shift in not only the way that we um, 
use resources, uh, but also the mindsets and the behaviour change that Lisa spoke about earlier. So there's a really strong opportunity and the, a reason why we focus on government and industry, but it's the consumers that actually have really quite a strong voice in what we see on our shelves and what we see um, you know, in the retail outlets, for example, that we engage with quite often in our daily lives. Um, so with that, I wanted to just get into a concept that's called citizen consumer. So this is a concept where we're saying that it is, a. am referring to household consumers when I talk about this, because we do obviously have consumers that are B2B consumers, but these are household consumers. And what we're suggesting is that participant individuals participating in a circular economy as opposed to a linear economy tend to have a different mindset. They have a mindset that the research suggests is that they're actually much more active in their decision making. They're much more active in looking to make a contribution to their community. So it's not just about consuming for convenience or for prestige or anything of that nature. It's actually much more about being a conscious consumer. And here are some examples of what's been uh, defined with regards to uh, a, a consumer that sits within a circular economy. So a conscious buyer who's, who's one that's actually abstaining from purchasing at all or buying new at all. So they're very much looking at secondhand or refurbished products as they need. Um, those that are caretakers are really quite conscious in maintaining products. So they're taking an active role to take the lawnmower to get service. They're taking an active role in, you know, just maintaining their products so that they can really avoid the malfunctions and potential um, end of life of that product. And then we have the reuser, which um, David highlighted in, in the marketplace sort of facility. So we've got those that are really quite interested in reusing those materials in their current form. Of course, recycling is actually um, a decomp decomposing materials into their raw, raw material, molecular structure in some cases, and reprocessing into new materials. But a reuser takes what they've got, they're taking their clothes, they're taking their vehicles, they're taking their um, their tools, et cetera, and they're reusing them and, and circulating through the economy. So what we're talking about is a, a, a citizen consumer taking active participation and really looking to support not only themselves and their households, but also the community in which they sit. And this slide uh, suggests is, is actually an adaptation of a piece of research that the European Environment Agency has published. And this is on decision making. What's the difference between a linear consumer making decisions and a circular consumer making decisions? And what they've summarized is that it's, it's looking at three stages. So you have a purchase stage, um, again, recognizing that consumers are not so involved in that design stage, but they start at the purchase stage, we've got a use stage and an end of use stage. And some of the questions that a, that a citizen consumer in the circular economy might say is, should I buy? Should I buy at all? And if I am going to buy, do I consider leasing or renting or sharing? Sharing examples such as go get, you know, it, it, making the conscious decision to let go of your vehicle and actually use a car sharing platform. If I'm going to buy, do I buy refurbished or do I buy pre-loved secondhand as we've often called it? And if you're buying new, are you actually making a conscious decision that you're buying a product that can be maintained, that is durable, that will last a long time and can be deconstructed or basically taken a bit by the sum of its parts at the end? So we're actually very conscious making decisions at that purchase stage. Once you've got the item, you're then going through a different set of questions. Do you keep using that product for as long as, you, as, as possible? keeping the materials and use uh, in for a much longer time. Are you taking care of it? Are you maintaining it? And what, what are people doing at end of life? Are they donating? Are they selling or sharing? And then we've got that end of use stage. And there's a little bit of crossover between the use and the end of use. What we're talking about here is, can we make the conscious decision rather than just putting it into the landfill of exploring, could we take it could we take the washing machine to a washing machine service centre and decompose those parts, and make them available for the future? So it's a really, it's an interesting um, 
perspective to think that there is actually a mindset, and this is what you know we we're talking about earlier with behavior change, there's actually a mindset to go from a linear mindset in consumption to a circular mindset. And these are some examples of what we're talking about. So the circular economy is really, it's about consciously thinking uh, through any purchases that we consider. Um, and it is a paradigm shift. It's definitely a paradigm shift to what we're used to. And it's not necessarily going to be easy or fast. This is something that's going to take you know, many years. If we look at the, the shift that we've seen in cigarettes, not quite the same thing, but we've taken many years to have a shift in the way that we engage with that product, um, both because of legislation and because of social norms. The paradox is that we don't have a lot of time. We do need to start making these decisions now. We need to start ramping up those decisions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The social norm element of this is um, related to education. And David mentioned that 61% of the people in the survey that was conducted by Combank actually didn't know what the circular economy is. And this resonates with some of the research that we've done with businesses as well, that, that only 27% of our sample could accurately identify what the circular economy was uh, from a list, a provided list. So education is a really important element. I know that I've only got a short amount of time. I wanted to also touch on what kinds of reforms are we talking about for consumers? So we know that consumers can make individual uh, decisions when they get to the store or when, they, when they're online and they're making decisions about what they want to bring into their households. But I feel like that there are some key reforms that might be interesting um, that would influence what consumers can do. And these are some of the reforms that I've, that I've uh, summarised, both from the EU legislation, and the European Union, of course, is, is quite far ahead with these discussions um, and legislation. But I also wanted to refer uh, to the ComBank research as well. And so I think for me, extended producer responsibility or the theme of responsibility more generally is actually the, over, is the umbrella of, of where the shifts need to be made. I think the opportunity that, that comes from separate collections, designing for durability, designing for re recyclability and repairability can all come under the producer being uh, responsible for that material. We see this in container deposit schemes. These are simple examples of what we see here in Australia that could be considered um, EPR. I particularly wanted to make emphasis on the durability and longevity of products through repair and maintenance. Um, we're learning from the EU that it's not just citizen consumers, that it's actually around procurement, as I mentioned earlier. One thing about repairability, though, that's interesting, um, and we've got the Productivity Commission's reports on the right to repair. I think that there is a, a strong opportunity to adopt the recommendations that were included in that with regards to increasing competition in the repair of products, increasing consumer education, and for example, through the Remade in Australia uh, proposal that's been launched recently by the federal government on a verified labelling scheme, which adds to that transparency question that you were talking about, David. One thing that we need to recognise is that we need to make repair equitable. Um, it's one thing to suggest product as a service, but what that does is it ties the consumer to the organisation or to the company that's selling the product. Oftentimes when we see that you must go back to a registered uh, repair outlet, is that actually developing equitable access to the circular economy? And is it actually increasing the opportunities for social cohesion and community building through what is often seen as an informal economy in the repair space? So I think the repair element of what we're talking about moving forward needs to move beyond just product as a service where one is tied to an organisation or to a repair facility, to be able to feel empowered that one can repair their own goods and support community development of that repair, um, repair sector as well. Um, I'd also like to see that there's an opportunity for tax deductions for repair, which might inspire people to spend money on repairing rather than just going for new. Uh, this has also been discussed in the European Union, and I think it's something that if one was to consider having to spend $20 on a repair or $40 on a repair of a small item versus buying a new item for 60, maybe that might start to sway some of the, the thinking for people um, as they move forward. 
And I just wanted to also highlight that consumer education, and this is where um, certainly Planet Art um, traditionally over those 30 years has been very focused on consumer education. And I think that there is a strong opportunity, excuse me, for us to use our voices um, with as consumers to really shift uh, the practice of design within uh, the industries that are developing products onto the market. And what we're also talking about is using our voice to enable a much larger and much more equitable access to the circular economy through repair and the other R's that were mentioned previously. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is encourage citizen consumers to be increasing in our, in our environment. And so every time you stand and look at the shelf, is there an opportunity to make those decisions of do I buy and do I not? I'll close there, but I just wanted to add a, a few extra points that um, citizens are already participating in the circular economy. Um, we know that the Gumtree report um, this year that was launched a, a few months ago highlighted it's about $7,000 worth of idle goods sitting in any one home in Australia. Um, many of those are being traded on platforms. Reuse is, an, is a valuable uh, circular economy tool. And so we're already participating in these shared assets that we're sharing and selling on marketplaces. Um, we're participating in product stewardship schemes, returning our containers. Uh, some of us are also um, participating in you know, sustainable salons, this kind of thing. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity that we can already build on um, that's already taken place within the, within the citizen consumer. Um, with that, I'll leave it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Nicole, and so many insights there to follow up on um, Combank as well. And I think it's terrific to see that um, there is you know, the opportunity for change can still give us what we need. And I think that's what businesses and all of us are looking for. So, Nicole, we'll see you in a second with Dave on the panel, but now we're going to go to Timothy Dawson. Tim, you're the co-founder of PV Industries. Um, and CEO of PV Industries, and you're coming from a background in economics, marketing, and agriculture. Um, you've adapted your experience and skills to build a solar panel recycling venture from the ground up, which was very exciting. We want to hear about that. Um, and you're focused on developing and managing partnerships across that supply chain. That's really important to delivering those outcomes to build that circular economy for solar in Australia. And you've secured 3.8 million in government grant funding, um, and you're providing services for decommissioning, collection, reuse and recycling of solar panel waste, which we heard from Ali, what was it? 240 um, Mount Everest, if we pile them all up on top of each other, a massive waste strain or and potentially new resource strain. So over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Um, well, I'm gonna start with the story. In 2019, uh, 4,000 solar panels were sitting in North Queensland and they reached the end of their life. And uh, no one knew what to do with them, so a council put them into landfill. And after hearing about this, my co-founder, uh, James and I, we took a solar panel into his garage and we pulled it apart by hand, piece by piece. And that's how PV Industries was born. Unfortunately, Ali's left, because um, I was going to get him to do some more uh, back of the envelope calculations because I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is we've actually installed 90 million solar panels um, in Australia. So that's including residential, uh, commercial and large scale solar. And I think Ali was referring to residential. So what's on people's homes. So the good news is we've actually installed a lot more than that. The bad news is what's gonna happen when these solar panels reach their end of life. And if we, you know, next year we'll probably be approaching uh, 100 million solar panels. So what would that be? 480 Everest. So it is a very sizable waste stream. Right now, most of those solar panels that reach their end of life go to landfill. This is a graph of Australian solar capacity. And everything to the left of that red line is solar panels that are already over the age of 10 years. It's reasonable to uh, expect that these solar panels will be uh, replaced and upgraded in the near future because the, uh, because of the growth in solar technology and uh, modern panels are much more efficient. Everything to the right of that red line is where we're heading. 
and you can see the exponential uptake in solar around 2017-18 when we started to install uh, solar panels across regional areas on solar farms in large volumes. Our mission from day one has been uh, to keep solar panels out of landfill. So how does it work? It's pretty simple, really. We collect solar panels, recover the materials to their highest possible value, and then we sell those materials for use in local manufacturing to create new products. We've developed two pieces of machinery, being our deframer and our deblaster. You can see our second generation deframer there on the right. It's that handsome bloke. And on the left, you can see some uh, solar panel frames and some deframed solar panels. Here we've got some junction boxes that have been uh, removed using our deframer. And on the right, you can see some uh, a sample of glass that we removed using our deglassing machine. Let's look at a case study. Um, I really like this case study of Boston Council because it's a really good example of what's happening on a daily basis and the um, decision that consumers are making every day. So they had a system that was installed in 2010 on top of the sports center and it was 15 kilowatts. They worked out that uh, they could upgrade that system using more efficient and more powerful solar panels and increase that system size from 15 kilowatts to 55 kilowatts in the same number of panels. This is um, a really good example because this highlights the decision that consumers are facing at the moment, which is that the solar technology has gotten so much better and so much more powerful and efficient and they can upgrade to a new modern system and then save more on their greenhouse gas emissions and their electricity bill. So far, we've raised 3.8 million in government funding from New South Wales EPA and Sustainability Victoria. And we have a string of amazing partners that we work with to help us achieve our mission. Let's look at our uh, New South Wales EPA circular solar trial. We've used this funding to trial different methods for collection and logistics and uh, that we can scale up across New South Wales. We've developed prototype processing machinery, enabling us to recover these materials to their highest possible value. We're activating new end markets with a particular focus uh, on glass, which has traditionally been a problematic uh, waste product and also comprises most of the solar panel by weight. We've been educating and engaging key stakeholders across the supply chain, including solar installers, local and state governments. And more recently, uh, we've also branched out to other materials within a solar installation, which include inverters and lithium ion batteries. So what does a circular economy for solar look like? Well, we're working hard to create one. And our core focus has always been on resource recovery and recovering the material to their highest possible value. So it's that recycling aspect that we've already spoken about this morning. There's all these other elements that come into the mix to creating a circular economy for solar, and they'll need to be unlocking new end markets for all of these recovered materials, uh, developing novel and innovative processing machinery to handle these new waste streams and waste products for solar panels, inverters, batteries, uh, establishing collection logistics methods. And this is a massive challenge for solar because of the sheer uh, scale of the size. It's easy enough to take your consumer electronics uh, to your local recycling day, but it's a lot harder to take your 12 solar panels um, and uh, get them recycled or get them processed. So establishing collection, collection and logistics methods that make, um, make it more accessible and more efficient uh, is essential um, to creating a circular economy. Moreover, testing of uh, components to enable them for reuse and also looking at those other materials that combine to form part of the solar installation being lithium ion batteries and inverters. So that's a really brief snapshot of PV industries and what we do. Um, I suggest if you're interested in keeping up to date on everything that we've got going on, you can follow us on LinkedIn. That's a really good way to stay up to date. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was fantastic. I might call up David and Nicole now. We're going to have a bit of a chat. If you, David and oh no, Nicole and Oh, so grab the microphone over there and come over this way. I want to ask you first, Tim, we'll just stay with you. And by the way, Circular Australia is super proud to be a partner with this project, but it's really gritty work. How's the project going? And you talked a little bit, I like that last slide, around um, what that 
um, a circular economy looks like. But what's actually needed to scale this? Because let's face it, to get those Everest, we're going to have to scale. Yeah, great question. Um, scaling is really hard, and especially for uh, an industry or an industry does, that doesn't really exist yet, being solar panels. Um, you know, it's a new industry, it's only emerging as its own thing, being a renewable energy. Um, and now we're already talking about recycling it and processing it and recovering those materials. Um, so it's a really big challenge. I think key for achieving scale uh, in this industry or in this new industry is going to be establishing those collection and logistics methods. Um, that's going to be a massive factor. But then the other side of it too is um, the, the consumer side and getting uptake. We've been, you know, in year one of our uh, business, we spent a lot of time educating uh, the solar industry and making them aware of this option. And the more that people can use the service and the more that people can be a part of this circular economy, um, the quicker we'll be able to get there and provide the service at a greater scale. And that's what it really comes down to this whole circular economy approach. It's everyone working together in a way. Um, we need people to kind of contribute to that. Okay, thank you. Can, Dada, can I get you to come over this way a little bit just to go to you quickly? You know, when we reflect on the sort of strong regulatory environment that's driving circular economy business and consumer behaviour in Europe, and just both those innovative approaches and business models, um, do you think Australia's businesses are ready for this important transformation? And um, it's obviously important to Pong Bank because for you to get reduce your carbon emissions, you've got to work with your partners. To Tim's point, we've got to work together. But are we ready and why? Yeah, I think it, it's a hard question to answer without discounting a lot of the really good work that's going on because there is a lot. But when we look at the consumers' responses to their perception of the circular economy, you can clearly see that's a bit of a gap. So clearly, we need to do a lot more. Um, I think it's probably more around a shift in marketing and how we value the message that we put out about a product or a business. So I'd be bringing forward a bit more about social purpose and our ESG messaging because clearly that's what customers want to learn. Uh, but then how do you balance the features and benefits of a product or, or a business and the ESG impact? Um, so that's why I'd say no, but I'm optimistic that we're on the right path to get there because from what we've learned with our conversations about this report is every business is thinking about it. And you, you mentioned the bank's impact uh, through APRA. Our, um, the, the carbon emissions of our customers will be put on our balance sheet. So we want to work with businesses who are trying to reduce carbon because we'll get a slap on the wrist if we're over. So you know, those type of initiatives are going to really push the envelope here and hopefully add up over time and make that impact that we're trying to achieve. Nicole, can you just, um, some great insights before, but how can consumers sort of find their way to more circular products and services to David's point? And I might just invite you to come over this way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I think there's, there's a number of ways. Um, I think asking questions is actually a really important um, tool that people can use to actually ask questions of products um, that they're seeing on the market. If you're seeing a label that says that there's an inference of a circular economy, that can come back on But some kind of inference that uh, suggests that there is a, um, an environmental benefit or a social benefit is to actually ask the questions. Don't just take things for granted because we're in a phase now where many more are becoming more conscious uh, and, and rightly so, the, the producers and manufacturers are actually realising that they need to be on the back and actually start. Sorry, uh, okay. uh, I saw a bunch of stuff on Facebook. So, actually, I was participating in the circular economy because I was circulating the products at their highest value, not selling them as parts or you know, 
means that we're broken is actually selling valuable products. Yeah, to your point earlier that there's about seven thousand dollars on average sitting in our cupboard. So you know we should be getting that out into the economy. Just staying with you, Nicole, what sort of key reforms would you like to see for consumers? And you touched on a little bit, but just in light of the EU frameworks and David's comment, uh, David's presentation earlier. I think that there's a couple of key issues. I think this question about recurability is actually a really important one. The productivity commissioner I don't want to work on that. I think we need to increase the accessibility and equity for repair. But I think the education piece is really, if education is actually a policy instrument, it's part of policy instruments, education is one of them. And I think we need to be uh, investing in education to break down some of these terms that we're all hearing, even for businesses as well. If businesses know ESG, they know net zero, et cetera, et cetera. But what does that actually mean? Um, and being able to provide that, that education to break down the silos, I think is really important. Great. David, let's just quickly go to you. Which consumer sectors do you think can sort of lead the way based on report? And then what sort of research and what sort of support do they need from government? Yeah, I think um, we're seeing a lot of effort in the clothing space. Uh, given that it is probably the most visible um, area of consumption that we have in our homes. Um, so a lot of brands are trying to find ways to rethink their manufacturing processes and their product sourcing. Um, and that's where I think we're seeing a lot of innovation. But there's a couple of other really good examples uh, around looking at different types of materials that go into a product, like a shift towards bamboo as a fiber because it's more sustainable for cotton and all those types of things. But if we look at uh, government mechanisms to help push things along, it's definitely going to be I think, a characteristic approach. We're kind of seeing the stick with, you know, APRA impacting the bank, which will then flow into small businesses. Uh, but I think from a, a carrot perspective, the tax incentives that you mentioned, both from a business perspective and a consumer perspective, I think would be a really good way to do things. Uh, I think innovation grants and, and sort of uh, incentives financially to help promote businesses to move towards this space and then some of it will be quite important. Um, and then I think, to, to your point, that the education and just changing the narrative around how we speak about these things from government will be really important. And then hopefully, you know, at the start of a new administration, we kind of steer the conversation there for it, like some other election cycle or something like that. Well, look, I think that's a great way to end it. We're on time now. Join me in thanking our fantastic panel. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us both here in person and online. And don't forget to you can get access to these presentations, take it down, take circular economy to heart. And we hope that you're going to really get involved now. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you and have a great week.